Welcome to another episode of Access to Perspectives Conversations. Today, we're here with Adi Kulibali from Ghana. Um, I'm glad you could join us, Adi. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Hefman. You can call me Joe. Just say Joe. It's fine. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, thank you so much, Joe, for the invitation. I'm really glad to be on your podcast. Um, the, the honor is all mine. So, um, everyone, Adi works as a consultant at a company called Bolingo um, in Ghana. And Bolingo is um, basically a consultancy to foster language diversity and overcome language and cultural barriers across Africa. And um, Adi has specialized, or the way I found out about your work was on the Multilingualism in Africa conference. That happened, I think it was last month, um, where you reported about one of your projects for localizing languages or African languages or localizing knowledge through language. Um, I'm new to that concept, even though we do a lot, um, quite a bit of translational work now, so with Africa Archive. But um, we hear more about that from you. So could you um, start by introducing yourself and telling us about a uh, shortcut of your journey that led you to the work you do today with Bolingo. All right. So as you, you mentioned, my name is Adina Maran Kulibali, and I'm a feminist. So I, it's something I always like to mention when I have the opportunity. I really like to talk about women's empowerment and it's important. So my journey into the localization and language services industry started in 2016 when I got admission into a master's program. So I did a master's in conference interpreting at the Advanced School of Translators and Interpreters, which is found in Boya in Cameroon, in the Southwest region of Cameroon. Mm. And that program was really a very defining moment of my life because uh, it, it was so challenging, um, so stressful. I don't know if other interpreting programs are this way, but it was really, really stressful. Um, but it was very interesting because interpreting actually challenges you to think, you know, and, and to really be abreast with so much information to, um, it, it also refines a lot of skills like mental dexterity and your capacity to remember a lot of things and all that. So that program was really, really important, particularly important when it comes to African languages was a course we did that was community interpreting. So we had this course it was not only community inter interpreting, but also community translation. So during this course, we had the opportunity to translate and interpret in our native languages. And although the, the professor um, at the time, Professor Tiayon, didn't understand our languages, he was able to, to tell us you know, where we, we made mistakes, where we could improve. And you can imagine students coming from you know, all over the continent of Africa, in being in one class. And so the diversity of languages was really, really striking. And that course was, was really important for me and I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. So after, after that program, I, I returned to Ghana and then um, I went to do a one year master's in philosophy in Pretoria. So I did a human rights program for one year. Mm -hmm. Then I came back very excited. I I was thinking about what to do next. And then of course, COVID-19 struck. And um, during that time, I had the time, the opportunity to reflect over what I really wanted to do. And that's when Bolingo was actually born. And um, yeah, that's where the, the journey actually began. Well, so that's one more example of what good the pandemic brought us into this world. Like out of necessity, sometimes good things arise and more often exactly. than you might consider. Um, I would like to um ask you because you mentioned in the beginning that you're passionate about uh feminism and women's rights. Do you feel that language is a catalyst for achieving gender equity like is do you see Sorry, i didn't get the question do you see a connection between your activities and the passion you have for fighting for women's rights through feminism 
Um, and there is a connection with that and local languages. How using the local language can either catalyze um, equity or sometimes maybe also hinder. Like what's the role in, in language or multilingualism, mm. particularly to women's empowerment? That's a very interesting question. Um, also because I haven't thought about it in that lens. But okay. from my perspective, I see it that when we have more women, you know, being in these positions of influence and um, leadership, we are able to also impact and influence. Because when I'm, for instance, when I'm making a hiring decision in my company, I always make sure that we um, have enough space for women and, and mm -hmm. ladies. And so that's one key part of it. With regards to the, the impact of local languages on women, that um, I think we might need some research. But so far, the, the data that I have seen in Ghana, for instance, there is data from the recent population census about these speakers, various speakers of native languages. But their data is not um, you know, broken down into you know, how many women are literate or, or not. That could be um, something to think about for, for research purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe we can identify some which already, well, maybe there's already literature available, but I also haven't looked at the connection at all. It just occurred to me to ask you because you mentioned both. Um, and there's certainly room for more research in this direction. Now at Bolingo, um, what are the, the kind of activities that you do with Bolingo and your team? And, um, yeah, what are like frequent inquiries you get for um for activities and services to to provide to other organizations, to regional or trans-regional uh, maybe events? So currently um our main services are translation, interpretation, publishing, and um voice projects or media localization. Mm. And interestingly, most of our clients reach out to us for local languages, especially um, our clients that are out outside the continent of Africa. They reach out to us for localization into African languages, but those that we have in the continent usually reach out to us for the colonial languages. So most of our clients are NGOs mm -hmm. that want to translate maybe their annual reports or they want to have conversations in, in various languages. And so they reach out to us. And so, yes, most of our work is into local languages. And last year, for instance, we, we worked with, uh, we were able to work on 15 languages, um, including Kirundi, Somali, um, Tswana, Shona, and, and many. So many East African and Southern African languages and some West African languages as well. Oh, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so could, could you please explain more what, language localization means i assume and also we talked before and i was also um, attending your presentation at the multilingualism conference um so from what i understand is you contextualize through translation but also cultural and like by adding cultural context to a piece of piece of text for example is that it like translating like Word to word is not enough. You need to also culturally contextualize the information. Yes. And how? Yes. So as I was, yes. Go ahead, please. I was just gonna add, like, how? What's a typical process to do that or workflow? How do you approach mm -hmm. a translate, like an a translation project? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So. Thank you so much. Um, as I explained during the multilingualism week, I had a presentation that was talking about localization specifically. Um, what what are some of the things to do and some of the things to avoid when working on, on the localization project? So I give the perspective of translators and then I give the perspective of project managers that are working on it. Essentially, localization has to do with creating, um, rather translating in a way that takes into account the cultural aspects um, of a language, not only the cultural aspect, but many other aspects that have to do with a particular country. For instance, 
the the way in which they write their dates you know for instance the currencies um you might want to take into account some of their favorite colors um and so on and so forth so localization as you explain it is usually bigger in scope than translation and so it could involve for instance having to translate um let's say for instance um tiktok into um maybe a santi tree or uh, into Bambara. So for those kinds of platforms, they are so big that there's so much, there's so many elements that go into translating or localizing these platforms. Um, you'd have the technical part of it, you have engineering, and then you have your, your translators and all that. So you really have to think about a lot of things when doing localization. And because we've had the opportunity to handle some of these projects at Bolingo, um, it's given us some experience, um, um, both interesting and, of course, the, the unfortunate part of it. It's been very challenging sometimes for some localization project. So to answer your question about what are the processes, um, I might not be able to give every all the processes because, it's of course, it depends on each project. But course, usually, yeah. the, usually um, you would have to agree on the target locale with a client. So if a client says, for instance, um, localize my platform into a language and that language has varieties. You have to agree on which varieties of the language you're going to, to localize into. Um, there's an example I always give, for instance, if a client says localize my content into tree, mm. tree is part of the, part of the Akan group of languages and it's spoken in Ghana. Mm -hmm. And so with the Akan group of languages, you have, you know, various languages in there. You have Asante tree, you have Fanti, you have Equiapim tree. And so you have to agree with the client that, okay, I'm going to, we're going to localize into a Santi tree. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you can now, um, of course, get your team together, um, go through the onboarding process and the checklist and all that. And then usually the first thing that we do is to, to put together a glossary and with a team. So, because the glossary is what is going to guide the team with regards to, you know, the recurring words, the common words, Mm -hmm. And that really helps them to ensure consistency in whatever they are doing. So putting the, together the glossary is so important. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, you would have um, to go through the materials for the project. You, there are language style guides, mm -hmm. um, you know, various guides that would be helpful when you're localizing. Mm -hmm. Because the client has a particular way in which you want to share a message. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, most social media platforms want to, the message to sound very positive. So even if you're translating something that is negative, they want you to translate it in a way that sounds positive. And so you have to take all these nuances into account when you're doing your localization. Mm -hmm. And of course, with localization, there is language quality assurance. You have to various processes to ensure quality. And you have to do internal quality assurance. And then the client will also do quality assurance. And so it's really... Um, it's really wide and encompasses a lot. But what I like about it is that it's also a learning process because for each project, we always learn something. You know, we mm -hmm. sometimes plan for the project and then there are setbacks and then we have to learn from it and then move on. And and so it's it's been an interesting process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I imagine like, it's huge learning there. Um, as I mentioned to you, we're also currently involved in a translational initiative with three other organizations, all of which are based in South Africa. And um, so there's ST Communications, which is also a, a company specialized in translating into African languages. Um, and then Masakana, which is a cross-continental organization based, well, with, with their lead in South Africa, but I think also um, almost registered in, or in the process of being registered in Kenya. Um, and then Science Link, which is a science communication um, consultancy, where we took research articles who are first authored by African scholars um, in English, Science Links providing short summaries, like lay summaries, or short summaries <laughs> of the research article, because the initially we thought we would translate the whole research article. It turned out there's way too many um technical terms 
And it would be too much work to translate 180 or 200 or more research articles with all the new terms to mm. be coined, like to be used in, the, in that language or in, in six other African languages for the first time ever, simply because these terms were so specific to research projects of various disciplines that they had not been present in the languages we chose for translation. So, so therefore we we figured okay it's a more feasible approach to then translate um, into lay summaries and to translate these which are closer to the actual spoken languages um, into the African languages and there also like this is now being done by um, translators like your team as well. Um, mm -hmm. And and also here we we're building um, glossaries to start with, which mm -hmm. we also share um, upon conclusion of the project. So I have a slight idea. I'm not involved in a translational pro process personally, mm -hmm. but I have a slight idea of the amount of work that goes into it. And um, I, like I'm also personally invested and interested, and I'm convinced that research. If it's done on a local level, um, it needs to be assessed on a culturally specific um, kind of perspective as well. But oftentimes we forget about that or we ignore that. Or I think many researchers are just not aware of how important that is. And I'm, I'm glad that we get to talk today because I'd really like to ask you if you can think of an example where it occurred to you through the work that you're doing how important it actually is to consider the cultural context of a story or maybe also going back to who your regular or typical clients are who like have you worked with with scholars also before to translate research articles because we tend to think there's a whole other level of complexity to translate research articles. Maybe not. Maybe you just think it's more, I don't know, more whatever. Um, but the complexity, I think, just comes with a cultural context. And what we in scholarly works might, might see as more complex is the complexity of the research topic, which is complex intrinsically as well but then often also simplified through the research approach. Sorry if, if I'm, I don't know if I'm making sense though, but <laughs> um, so the question for you now is, I think you already said that, of course, localization is important for the reasons you mentioned. Um, but yeah, if you could give an example on how how, how exactly, or with an example, like what's the importance about the localization of information? Okay. So um, before I answer that question, I just want to mention that at Bolingo, we also develop localization guides for African countries. And in these guides, we talk about the cultural and linguistic aspects, you know, of, of each country. So we've done for, Ghana, we've done for Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Senegal, and uh, yes, so these guys are very interesting. And um, when you were asking your question, my my mind went back to these guys because in these guides, we we talk about some of the things that are important to consider. For instance, um, we say that if you come to Ghana, and uh, let's say you are even if you're not in the localization industry, but you are an event company that wants to organize an event, and you would have to um, take into account the fact that um, there's a particular culture of, of lateness, you know, that um, in a way would impact on your event. So if your event um, is going to start at 9 a.m., uh, you might want to say, okay, it's good. let me, right, 7 a.m. so that people have two hours, you know, to, to join and all that. Um, and then also there's the aspect of politics. So let's say, for instance, you're creating publicity materials for your company and you use some colors. Let's say you use, um, um, I think, green and white. 
some colors are political. And so if you use too many of those colors, then you're kind of associating with a particular political party. And, and so these are some of the things to think, to think about. Just thinking about the culture of the people would really help you even, you know, in putting together your, your materials or your content for what you want to do. So, yeah, I think it's a very key um, point. Yeah, um, same, same here, obviously, as I, as I stress. So I think I was on research, um, like, okay, I'm also European myself, and a lot of what we find online nowadays in Europe and Northern America, and the biggest scholarly publishers are also based in either the United States or Europe. Um, there's also many others all around the globe. And there's also research being published in languages other than English. Um, any language, well, maybe not any language or all languages, but um, a whole lot of languages other than English. And then also, like, even for English, like you said, for Twi, there's various versions of English. So we have American English, British English. Most publishers differentiate between those two only, but then there's also Canadian English, Australian English, um, New Zealand English. Mm -hmm. I would also add South African English, Kenyan English, Ghanaian English. Um, <laughs> why, why would that be considered different? It's, it's just another version of what used to be a colonial language is now in many countries still some sort of a trading or even official language. So anyways, so that alone is, I think, another episode in its own worth of. Um, but back to translating into African languages now. Okay, now for research. And then, so if you, it, if in my case, I'm German, and I've also studied in Sweden, and I know for a fact that it's also an issue in Sweden, for many researchers to kind of being incentivized to switch their working language to English, even if they mm. study Swedish or German research topics. And that leads to the fact that you lose or don't even consider some of the information. Maybe you do conceptually, or we do, but maybe we don't know the English language well enough to embed the information in that language, which is not our mother tongue. Um, so I think there's two, two gaps in the system, like once to document in another language that's not our own, or that we have learned along the way and probably don't know well enough to, to also carry the information in another language that we don't know enough, well enough, but then and then there might also be information lost again as the readers of research articles try and extract information from the English narrative, which again was written by non-native speakers, went through some editorial processes and peer review. So might have been altered also for the style of the language so that the information might be misleading unintentionally by the authors or editors. Am I making sense? So I don't know how often that really happens, but I think that's a really, that's a real danger in how we practice research. And by not considering or fostering multilingualism enough. So this is something I'm personally passionate about and I want to just dive into a little bit deeper here with an expert on the show. So again, thank you for joining. Um, what what comes to mind when you hear me talking about these things? Yes, um, what comes to mind for me is, is is the fact that for us in Africa, most of us grow up in multilingual environments, and so mm. um, you would grow up in, in a place where you can speak two or more other African languages, mm. uh, and so that in itself is really significant, and so. From there, then um, we, you know, we we go to school, and usually in in most schools here, from kindergarten, you're you're speaking English. So at home, your parents are speaking the native language most often, and then in school you're speaking English. So there's that um, 
how can I even call it? But there is that incoherence or inconsistency that happens. And so sometimes um, it's difficult for children at that stage to even be able to imbibe some of the concepts. And, and then in addition to that, there are some schools where they say, don't speak vernacular. Most schools in, in Ghana, for instance, they tell the kids, don't speak vernacular. And by don't speak vernacular is don't speak your native language while you're in school. And so this goes on and on. And you have instances where, you know, children make mistakes in English. They, they are laughed at and people begin to think that um, fluency in English means smartness, some kind of smartness. And so it, it grows to the extent that um, even for those of us who start doing research, um, even when we are doing a research for a local community, I think you brought my mind to that the last time we had a conversation where you said that we do research for local communities, but the information is not even in their language. And that was really a striking factor for me. And so um, I think that through these processes, you know, from learning, um, not using your, your, your language, your native language as a medium of instruction in school, to being laughed at for making mistakes, um, grammar mistakes in English and all that. I think it compounds and it goes to um, a stage where we, we begin to lack confidence in our languages. And so because we lack confidence in our languages, I think it really has a lot of ripple effects. And so we end up not being you know, very good in English and also not good in our native languages. Um, and so it's it's something we need to think about. I, I think usually I, I talk about the policy part of it where we need to encourage teaching because we can't talk about sustaining our African languages when they are not being taught. And there are some countries in Africa where the languages are not being taught at all. Uh, an example is Cote d'Ivoire. There's no um, local or native language in Cote d'Ivoire that is being taught in schools. It's, it's only French that is being oh, taught really? currently. Oh, that's so sad. Yes. Oh. Exactly. And it's only recently that they actually, they actually started having that conversation about, you know, mm. having some curricula in place for the native languages. Mm. Uh, and so there's really so many facets of, of this situation. Um, but I think we can start with looking at the data that we have. Um, I spoke about the data from the Ghana Statistical Service, where they, they really have information about the speakers, the number of speakers not only speakers, people who are literate in native languages. Mm. Uh, and so that was interesting data. So there, for instance, let's say they say 2 million people are, are literate in Asante tree and so and so uh, places. And they mentioned the areas, the geographic locations. And I think that for researchers, this kind of data could be very important mm -hmm. so that when you're doing your research and you want to also translate some part of it, then you can think about... Um, how to popularize it, you know, how to spread the message, what kind of format you want to put the content into, but at least you have a starting point. Mm. And then based on that, you can have confidence and say, okay, when I translate my content um, into my native language, there will be people available who would read it. And then the next stage will be now, how do I, you know, make that message accessible or available to them? Mm. Yeah, that's, that's great. It's a great approach. I also mentioned to you, last time we spoke, um, African Science Literacy Network. Um, and um, the founder of the network is um, Mahmoud Maina. He is based in Brighton, mm. England. And is also um, yeah, on a really exciting next chapters in his career currently. And what I loved about that initiative was that he uh, intended with, he put a team together of science journalists or journalists generally and researchers to again also here translate research articles that are relevant for in his case Nigeria and um, or of any general interest and um, have researchers and journalists work together to convey the information to, um, to the locals and not in English, which many um, would probably also understand, but in uh, Nigerian local languages. Um, and I know that fr from some of your projects also, which one was it now? You had the first, you, or you helped to bring to life the first um, website in, what was it? What yes, Inakan. 
yeah oh yeah sorry so please tell us more about that project and and how how it's being received by the audiences yeah so in in ghana there the akan language is very popular and um it's used in the media so they are the the most uh, the, the radio stations that have the most audiences use this language. So they use Asante Tree to broadcast. And so you can imagine the audiences that they have. And most of these radio stations and TV stations that broadcast in Asante Tree in that native language, um, surprisingly, when you go on their website, they are, they are publishing in English. So they, they have articles that they, they, they write, but mm -hmm. everything is in English. And and so at Bolingo, we're just wondering and, and thinking about the situation and, and just wondering, like, why would they broadcast in Asante Tree? And then when you go on their website, like, everything is in English. And one interesting thing that we also heard is that even in the radio stations, the content that they are reading in the native language is in English. So mm -hmm. that was quite interesting. So they are actually doing site translation. So they are looking at it in English and then they are saying it's in the native language of course because they they've been doing it over and over again mm -hmm. so it becomes easier for them but it was really food for thought so we said okay um why don't we try this experiment and and have a website that is fully localized in uh that is fully in asante tree with all mm -hmm. the strings in in asante tree so we didn't we chose two varieties of our can we chose asante tree and fanti Mm -hmm. uh, and so we we got people to to write, and these people that we got are people who have studied for a bachelor of art in those languages. So people, someone who has studied bachelor bachelor of art in Asante Tree, bachelor of art in Fante. Mm -hmm. um, most of them are teachers, um, but we brought them in. We we taught them. We gave them some training on journalism and media writing, mm -hmm. and. Uh, we we told them the angles from which we would want them to write. Uh, we would want them to write like articles, information that are really um, very important. You know, not information that is just today and it's gone, but something that people can really benefit from. And so, we we put this platform out, and so it's actually the first platform that is fully, fully, fully in in Asante Tree and Fanti Tree. And the reaction has been really great. I mean, we've had people saying they've been waiting for this for a long time. Mm -hmm. And um, for the first month that we we released it, um, we had 2,000 um, site visits. Uh, and so the, there is interest, you know, but mm -hmm. I think what is lacking is the confidence that we need to unlock. Mm -hmm. So once we, we, yes, once we let people understand that uh, there's, there's confidence in your language, like use it, read, um, in your language, of course, there are some people who are not, you know, they can't read their language because they, maybe they didn't have the opportunity to study it mm. um, back in school. But this platform would help them, I believe, because we also have audio. So we have each article has an audio. So when you are reading, you can also listen to the audio and, you know, follow and also learn your language. So I think it's been a very exciting project and we are looking forward to, you know, expanding to other languages as well. Hmm. So let, let me just quickly ask how it works. So the website would still be accessible also in English, but then you translate it to two versions of three. No, so it's not available in English. So everything oh, is so only in three. the local language, yes. And it's not translated, it's generated. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. It's content creation, yes. But then because you said it's two versions of Akan, so can you switch between the two or is it always indicated? Exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so when you go on the sites, you can you can choose. So you can choose Asante Tree or Fanti and then you go oh. to where you want to. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's that's brilliant. Um at Africa Archive with like from the beginning we made we, we encouraged researchers for them to consider submitting research articles in their local language. And so there is like, um, there is a handful maybe countries in Africa who have a culture, a research culture in the local language other than Arabic, French, or English or Portuguese. Um, so for example, in South Africa, it's not well Africans. I don't know if you want to consider mm -hmm. that, but also Kosa and Zulu are becoming increasingly spoken and written about in scholarly works 
And I think there's also journals, research journals that publish in in those Southern African languages. Then in, in Tanzania, for sure, in Swahili, not so much in Kenya, but also in Kenya, you have Swahili journals, which are mostly in print. Mm -hmm. Some of them are online, but then these cannot be picked up by the Western, so to say, or Western European or North American scholarly indexing services and literature discovery tools, um, which is what we're trying to facilitate also with Africa Archive. Where I'm going at with this is, um, I, I agree with you, like there's a need to foster um, local languages for research or to, to speak and, and see online, like, yeah, that, that African traditional languages need more visibility for sure anywhere and also in research and i think like if we come back to what's the purpose of science and scholarship is usually many many researchers or anybody would would think and expect and also sign up to that research is here to serve societies and what if yeah so of course i would think and probably you as well, of course, we need to localize the knowledge and also through language. Like we said before from the onset and how we design research projects, but also to make the gained knowledge then again accessible to society stakeholders, including the citizens who would then consume the information in their local, local news outlets in their own language. So yeah, <laughs> basically that's what I want to say. Yeah, and um, yeah. yes, if I may, um, I'm oh, a yeah. guest, but I, I just want to ask a question mm -hmm. um, about uh, some of the ways that such information is disseminated. For instance, the, the research studies that are translated or localized into the native languages. What are some of the, the ways? Because I think reaching the, the, the local people might have some specific approaches or it could be based on the, the local, right? Yeah, I mean, it depends either way and both. I agree. I think there's always a need mm. to, um, like, there's also an increasing call and rely, re, relying on machine translation. But I think our our glossaries will never be precise enough to cater for local specificities. I think they can aid, but we will always need human beings as interpreters and translators to fine tune and reassure that information is being conveyed in the best possible manner. What was your question? Sorry. Uh, yeah, so the, the question was just about dissemination approaches. So oh, yeah. um, after the information is translated into the native language, the, the research um, summary. So. Yeah, so, so the good thing is now that an, an increasing number of publishers, also Western publishers, um, who have been gatekeepers for the longest time, several decades now, are now opening up to allow also technical interfaces for researchers as authors of the research articles to submit the research article in presumably English or French or Arabic, um, but then also to provide space that is machine searchable for translation of the title of the work and a summary. And that's increasingly um, mm. facilitated for also from scholarly publishers point of view and journals or yeah, from there through technical aspects, which then also makes these um, databases, so to say, searchable for African languages, if we manage to foster and increase an uptake of African scholars translating their own work into like, and if it's just the summary of it, that's already mm. a great start um, to provide that information because the publishers will not have the resources, but a research team might be able to use their research budget because the also budget for dissemination, which means publishing in a research journal, 
But now with open science and open access, mm -hmm. there's an additional call, uh, mostly also by research funders to mm -hmm. budget extra for um, societal impact. And societal impact can only be achieved if you also consider a translational aspect. So this is probably where you will see an increase in inquiries from scholars to your services. So this is basically where, where I see there's, I know there's a few, very few companies and consultancies like yours who specialize in translating research works and the demand is huge. So brace yourself. <laughs> <Inquiry>. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is really exciting because I mean I said before that the research um to translate research articles might is not unmanageable. So it's very much manageable. It's just that you probably want to work with either the re researchers themselves or with science journalists who can help to or maybe you can foster a department um of colleagues within Bolingo um to to summarize the research in a way that it's comprehensible by non-scholars and and also shorter shorter version of it. But that's totally doable. I mean it's it's a couple of hours work, but and that summary can then be translated. So this is basically our approach with the decolonized science project that I mentioned before. All right. So yeah, um, what is mm -hmm. it? like? Yeah, so so there's probably a lot of work coming your way. So, um, so opportunity for growth. Indeed. Okay. Um, what are your favorite projects to work on? And or what are other projects you would like to mention here? And what's the kind of topics you you most enjoy? I'm I'm sure you enjoy any any aspects of your work. Um, but what what sticks out from the portfolio of projects that you have run so far? Um, as an oh, this was particularly interesting because. There is one localization project that we are currently working on at Bulingo. It's for a social media company. I'm not allowed to say the name, but uh, I just want to say that it's it really stands out because um, it's really brought us in the limelight of localization in terms of what are those you know key elements that we should take into account. Um, what are some of the challenges? Because the challenges are are numerous and sometimes they are mind boggling. You know because you have to manage teams, teams that are culturally different from you. And, and I mean, you have to understand the team uh, because the, there's some, some of the teams, there's that religious aspect where they have to pray at certain times, where they are not available. Um, some of the team members, or most of the team you know, would frequently say, for instance, oh, I have family issues. And because you're not in that culture, you know, you're not able to really understand what it is. Uh, and so that's really been interesting for someone doing localization that I myself, I really would have to learn about the culture of my team so that I can also adapt and also understand their methods of communication, how to communicate with them that would have the most impact when I want to make a point. Um, because, um, you know, I, I read the culture map by, by Maya and um, she spoke about some of these things. Uh, and so all these things apply in localization because you're managing a team and you're managing projects. And so I think the, the human element of understanding how to communicate with your team um, is really key. And that is one thing I've learned in this project. And the fact that it also challenges me and I learn new things all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that that has been my my really um, defining moment you know, in my career um, as a language professional and as someone who is into localization. So working on a big localization project for the social media platform. Um, I think it's been interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. Learning how it works, learning how the interface is, learning about user interface mm -hmm. and, and understanding the key elements that 
or what it takes to um, ensure a successful delivery of a project that is really um, interesting for me. Yeah, I, I agree. Also, the bigger projects, they tend to have so many levels mm. of, again, complexity, technolo like technical aspects you haven't, like I haven't even thought of, of before. Mm. And it's such a steep learning curve and then team management and team communication, like, like you also mentioned. Yeah. Um, may I ask, what yeah. is your working language in the bilingual team? And now uh, I assume it's mostly English with international teams. And is your bilingual team also international to use English or do you also use Ghanaian languages to communicate internally or mix? Yes. So, uh, so here in Ghana, I mean, we have um, some of our team members that are outside Ghana, but for those of us in Ghana, each time we have team meetings, we um, actually speak a blend of English and um, the native language. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we do in our team meetings. So quite interesting there's, there's a team member who is fa who facilitates and he um speaks asante tree and he's always speaking the language and the interesting thing is that because it's very popular so even though some others are not from that native language i mean it's not their native language they're not from that ethnic group but they still understand it and so mm -hmm. um we use it usually for during our team meetings so um yes uh, but in our email communications and all everything else, we use English. Okay. Um, and what I also found in in an African context, in a country like Nigeria and even Ghana, like sometimes it's difficult to to start with one language. If you say, okay, we are looking at I don't know ten countries, and we can only we only have capacity for one language per country. Mm -hmm. And then a speaker of another language that's not chosen for that country might think, oh, why did you choose that language and not the one that I speak? <laughs> like, so <laughs> is there like a suggestion or best practice that you found for your team and your professional approach? Mm -hmm. Like maybe there is a purely numerical or metrics based approach that you, how you decide over one language over the other in a multilingual country like Ghana. Yeah, so that's a very interesting point. Um, usually what we do is to watch the numbers, right? So we look at which group is the biggest ethnic group, you know, which language is most spoken, for instance, uh, in a particular area. So if you're targeting a particular area you would have to to choose for it and and the question that you're asking of course would depend on which area so for instance if you come to um a country like ghana and you want to have just one language um, i would suggest asante tree because it's in terms of numbers the language has the numbers right but if you're targeting for instance a particular region then you would have to use the language that is most spoken in that region and so usually um i think just the, the numbers um, help, although, of course, it generates, um, you know, negative sentiment because people are very attached to their language and they would want, uh, you know, their language to be considered beyond the financial um, returns or, or whatever. But for the purpose of doing selecting one language, yes, we, we usually use the numbers to decide and, of course, the target that um, the target region or the target area that we want to explore yeah and probably also what the client wants and whatever their preferences might be but then you can still inform them on what is best practice and an ethical approach to choosing one language over the other if you have to choose i'm also asking this because in a scientific context we speak of lingua franca like scientific languages where there's a common assumption in Western Europe that English is the only and one and only lingua franca. Turns out it's not. There's also French, Arabic, uh, Portuguese mentioned those only for European and Euro-Asian context. And then obviously in India, there's um, Hindu. Then in China, there's Mandarin. We have Portuguese and Spanish for Latin America. In Europe. Um, 
French was already mentioned. And then, of course, Africa, there is also various lingua franca on a regional and, and local level. Um, so it's really wrapping our heads around a concept of we live on one planet mm -hmm. and we speak and live, well, we speak thousands of languages per region across the planet, really. And information is embedded in languages. So yeah, um, I don't know, like, is, is this a, a, a claim or a phrase you can, mm -hmm. you want to continue on coming to an end of this episode? Because I, I would, of course, want to give you the last word. Um, I just wanted to stress the importance of multilingualism for information sharing. Um, over to you. Yes. Yes, thank you. Yes, I think increasingly we, we keep talking about diversity and, um, you know, ensuring diversity in our use of languages is one of those things. And so um, to give an example, for instance, I mentioned that we do publishing at Bolingo. So we're doing multilingual publishing. So we're about to publish our first book, which is titled Ami Series. And so this book is about the environment. You know, it's about a girl that is passionate about saving the earth and she does a lot of activities to actually make that dream happen. And this is a book that we've um, localized. And I'm saying localized because we've, we've had to change her name in some of the um, translations. We've had to change the food that she ate, you know, to meet the, the local culture. And we are translating this book into five languages, including um, two Ghanaian local languages. So um, there's one language called Evigbe, which is spoken um, in the Volta region of Ghana. And then there's um, Asante Chi. So we chose those two. And we also chose Kiswahili, Arabic, and Zulu. You know, we wanted to have at least a language from each of the regions in the continent. So um, I think diversity is important. So just to mention that we chose Evigbe, although it's not like very well known, it's one language um, whose people are really attached to the language, like they really are passionate about it. So we thought like, okay, why not, you know, use also add this language to um, publishing for this book. So yeah, I think it's a journey. And as mm -hmm. language professionals, we also have a role to play. And because we are sometimes sitting um, in places where we can contribute to such decisions. And as you mentioned, ethical decision-making for our languages is very important. So mm -hmm. um, I think um, that alone is, is really great. It's an opportunity for us to influence mm -hmm. and also have an impact in promoting multilingualism. So mm -hmm. I appreciate the opportunity to be here as a guest for the podcast. And I hope that my contributions were meaningful and helpful as well. Absolutely, of course. For sure. Like I can testify and I'm sure every listener will say the same. But for this this time around, it's only unilateral, the information sharing. But um listeners, you are very more well, very warmly invited to leave a comment, to get in touch. You find Adi's details in the blog post and show notes to this episode. And yeah, if you have any questions about multilingualism, reach out to our team and we will also happily um, direct you further to Adi's team and the Bolingo services. Thank you so much, Adi, for making time for this and speak to you soon again. All the best. Thank you. All right.